Drugs might be fun until they get out of control. So in this section of the video, we're going to be talking about drug addiction and in particular, its connections to learning. So once again, as a disclaimer, I feel obligated to say that please do not alter your pattern of prescription drug compliance as a, as a consequence of anything I say ever, and especially as a consequence of anything I say in this video. And to please consult with a medical care professional if you need further guidance about your prescription drug use. So. With that said, uh, we're talking about drug addiction, so I want you to just take a moment and think about what that means to you. How would you define it? So this could be a really sensitive topic, so I want you to give, make some space for yourself to really reflect, especially if this is a topic that is um, of personal significance to you, um, and try to come up with a definition. You can pause the video if you want to. Come up with a definition that is not only has a scientific content, but something that might be used in a clinical, social context, or especially in the justice system, because there's a lot of things that are wrapped up in our uh, stigma of drug addiction. So I looked at the definition of drug addiction, and according to the, the US government, addiction is a chronic relapsing brain disease characterized by compulsive drug taking despite adverse health, social, or legal consequences. There's a couple of pieces that I want to unpack here. And the first one is addiction is defined as a chronic and relapsing brain disease. In other words, there's no judgment here in terms of addiction being a personal or moral failing. It is a brain disease in the same way that, let's say, multiple sclerosis is a brain disease. In particular, it has the following symptoms. There is compulsive drug taking. And in particular, it's not just a compulsive drug taking and that one is taking a lot of drugs, but it's compulsive drug taking despite adverse consequences. And these consequences could be adverse consequences to one's health, one's social, one's social circle, or having legal ramifications. And so in this definition, there's a lot of things that are wrapped up together. And we're gonna be talking a little bit about how it is it might be possible from a molecular perspective, given now what we know about how drugs like cocaine and heroin can affect the molecular targets of your nervous system, how it is that you can end up behaving in such a way that you're taking, you're, you're having compulsive drug seeking behavior despite negative consequences. I'm gonna take a really abstract view at this, and so bear with me. I think this is a really interesting story that has some interesting computational consequences as well. So the story here is that we have this hypothesis that drug addiction accesses the same neurophysiological mechanisms as natural learning. And that's why it makes it so pervasive and so dangerous because it's actually tapping and hacking into a system that is in fact quite useful for the rest of our lives. So what do I mean by natural learning? So let's, let's think about a simple version of natural learning. Let's say that you eat cake and it tastes good. You learn that it is good to eat cake and the next time you see cake, you might have cake seeking behavior. You have learned this because it's good. At the same time, maybe you uh, have touched a hot stove, you didn't know what it was. The first time you touched it, you burnt your hand. This is painful and it was really bad. And you, through a mechanism called natural learning, just learning, regular learning, you learn that maybe next time I will not be putting my hand on the hot stove, especially when there's heat pouring off of it and it's glowing red. Okay? This is good. This is good because this is natural learning that makes it so that we are able to change and modulate our behavior as a function of environments changing so that not all of our behaviors are hardwired. We can learn things about our environment and change the, the ways we act so that we have more good things like cake and fewer bad things like burnt hands. Okay? So one way of thinking about natural learning is the theory of reinforcement learning. Now, the theory of reinforcement learning goes way back in lots of different disciplines. There's control theories that do it, there's machine learning people that do it, there's a lot of neuroscientists that think about reinforcement learning because it is such a successful model in the, our understanding of the nervous system as well as a really successful algorithm for designing of things like robotics and other things that we might want to control. So, there's a version of reinforcement learning that I'm putting up here. The details don't matter because I'm just going to break apart this equation for you. And this is what's called temporal difference learning. And the way to interpret this uh, equation is that this version of reinforcement learning says the value of some action A. So A here might be, okay, I see cake, I'm going to go grab cake. The action of grabbing a cake, okay, the value of that action is the sum of the expected reward of getting that cake discounted by how long it's gonna take for me to get to the cake. 
I'm going to say that one more time, okay? I am here in the state K. State K is I'm sitting here. There's cake across the room, all right? I want the cake. And so the action, the value of the action is how good is it going to be after I walk across the room and get the cake, discounted by the time it's going to take me to make that action, to take the steps across the room. So if the cake is right in front of me, the value of getting the cake is actually going to be higher than the value of the action of walking across the room to get the cake, or maybe even across town to the, my favorite cake shop, because it's the expected reward of getting the cake discounted by how long it's going to take me to get there. Okay. This works the other way around as well for negative rewards. So uh, a negative reward, like touching your hand on the big stove, is a negative reward. It's discounted by how long it's going to be to get there. So future pain that's far away in the future is going to be less bad than the immediate pain right now, according to this model of learning. Now, the reason we can use this model of learning is because baked in here is a way to update my value of action A. This is how I'm going to learn whether or not an action is something I actually want to do or I don't want to do by updating it in the following way. We are going to have an update that is the difference between what happens if I take this action versus the value of what happened if I don't take this action, if I just stayed right here and didn't do anything at all, okay? We talked about in the previous lecture about the dopamine pleasure reward system in the recreational drugs in the brain lecture and about how your dopamine system is one of the ways that encodes this difference, this unexpected reward difference between what actually happened and what you were expecting to happen. This is exactly what this equation says. It's the difference between what actually happened if you were to do this and what happens now if you don't do anything, okay? Now remember from the recreational drugs video, that the dopamine system is exactly what drugs like cocaine tap into. In other words, if you are on cocaine and you are an ag your antagonist for the dopamine reuptake system, so that dopamine sticks around for longer, instead of having a negative prediction reward saying like, oh, like, you know, last time I was on drugs, something bad happened. I don't want to do that again. Because you are tapping into and hacking into the dopamine system, the drug seeking policy, the policy of let's go get more drugs, always, always has a positive dopamine and has a positive prediction of reward. And this is a hand wavy explanation, I'm not being too rigorous here, about why cocaine and other addictive drugs can tap into the dopamine system and physiologically make it so that even though at some level, somewhere in your brain, you know this is a bad thing, there are adverse effects. I mean, losing my friends, I'm losing my jaw, I don't actually even feel happy doing it. Despite all of those adverse effects, because every time you take the drug, there is a positive dopamine signal, you persist in going down this path and taking the action that implements a drug seeking policy, even though there's part of you that knows you really shouldn't. And in this way is what makes drug addiction such a devastating disease is because even when one realize that one wants to stop doing it, one physiologically cannot do it because the drug is tapping into this physiological system of dopamine. So we talked a little bit about the dopamine system. Okay, and how we can hack into that and use re uh, re reward and reinforcement learning as a model of how to explain one way of explaining this, this uh, drug seeking behavior despite adverse effects. Next, we're gonna turn our attention to the opioid system, which also taps into that system in a slightly different way. And here I'm gonna talk about a little bit of a story that goes back in history. And I think this is more of a, this is like less of a, less of a social legal history, more of a, more of a history of the, of the drug industry, okay? So opioids are derived from the poppy, Papaver somniferum, and has been used medicinally for you know, probably all of human history, right? Lots and lots of people have been distilling um, opioid compounds from poppies and using them as an anesthetic for a very long time. And its, its medicinal properties are well known before the modern era. Now, where we got off the rails is the following. So here, I'm showing you two different molecules that are known to have pain-killing anesthetic properties. There is morphine, which is distilled from the poppy, and salicylic acid, which is developed from willow. Both of them are used, again, in terms of folk medicine all around the world for medicinal purposes, for purposes of managing and curing pain, okay? Now, both of them had some undesirable properties. Salicylic acid, even though it was really effective at, um, at, at, 
at, at, at killing pain, was prone to upsetting the stomach. And so with the advent of modern chemistry, what happened was that uh, a German company called Bayer, otherwise it's spelled Bayer, acetylated salicylic acid from the willow. And so instead of having salicylic acid, you had acetosalicylic acid, otherwise known as aspirin. So this is how modern aspirin was, in, was invented, by taking a compound that many people have used for all of human history and then doing a little bit of chemistry on it so that you get a medicine that, that has the curative properties of killing pain but is less hard on the stomach. So this was such a successful invention at the time that they turned their eye to morphine. And morphine from the poppy, as you know, was extraordinarily effective at killing pain, but it was also known to be really addictive. So the logic was the following. Well, what, acetylating, salicylic acid works really well. Well, let's, let's acetylate morphine too, okay? So they did that and they made diacetylmorphine, otherwise known as heroin. That is how heroin was invented. It was invented because aspirin worked so well that they thought they would do it to morphine too. It was first synthesized by Alder Wright in 1874. And without a lot of testing, it was marketed as a less addictive form of morphine. I think this is just like a really fascinating story of chemistry, but also of the pharmaceutical industry. So here's a really old ad from Bayer where they are advertising literally aspirin and heroin on the same poster as if they were comparable, um, comparable things. So morphine is an opioid and there are other opioids now that are on the market. Uh, fentanyl, for example, is one of them. And deadly overdose due, due to opioids, as many of you have probably heard, has become an epidemic in the United States and other parts of the world as well. It's become so devastating that um, it's, uh, it's, it's something that I feel obligated to tell you all about because it is relevant for the chemistry um, of synaptic transmission because, uh, and also this chemistry story we talked about. So, Deadly overdoses to morphine can be, can be partially prevented by a, um, by a drug known as naloxone. And naloxone is a extremely effective competitive agonist for opioid receptors. So if someone is at risk of overdosing from an opioid, very fast administration of naloxone, what it's going to do is that the opioid receptors are GPCRs, Okay, so what it's gonna do is, what a competitive ag antagonist means is that it's going to compete for the same binding site the opioids are going to bind on those opioid receptors. And instead of binding to the opioids, it's going to bind very quickly and tightly to naloxone instead. It's gonna kick them all out, right? Thereby neutralizing this action. This saves lives. Naloxone can be an injectable, and it also actually comes in a nasal spray form that can be very easy to administer. So if it is something that you would consider, I encourage you to look into your uh, local laws and regulations and pharmacies in terms of how one might um, have, the, have the permission to carry around an Arcan or naloxone. It's an extremely effective way of saving somebody who might be at risk of dying of opioid overdoses. Um, so Jerome Adams, uh, a former Surgeon General of the United States, actually was advocating that we should think of naloxone kind of like EpiPens and CPR as one of the frontline um, inter interventions that the general public should have and have be aware of because it really does save lots of lives.